there are 43 quintillion possible combinations. Now imagine you have no websites, no books, and no one to show you how to solve it, because you invented it. But you didn't invent the Rubik's Cube. This guy did. My name is Alan Rubik. I was born here in this beautiful city of Budapest. It was 1974. 30-year-old Erno Rubik was just beginning his career in academia. I was lecturing design and architecture. I was very similar in age with the students. I was very ambitious to find new ways to teach them, especially about space and three dimension. I made a cube as a teaching aid and for myself to learn something from it. Once the physical cube was put together, Erno began hunting for its secrets. The question was not, uh, it is possible to solve it, but the question was, it is possible to find a method to do that. There is 26 small cubes. It looks the same, but in the structure of the cube, they have different rules. Erno racked his brain for a strategy, twisting and turning the cube in his hands and his head to unlock his creation. After I started to understand the nature of the structure and the movement, I found a way for a solution. It's not a straight way. And after a month, he cracked the code. But the story doesn't end there. I had the feeling, the potential of the object. I found it very simple to manufacture. And the result of that, it can be an object that is available for everyone. In 1980, Erno would finally bring his cube to the world. And from there, it took off, becoming one of the best-selling toys of all time. Because of the content of the cube, the world discovered it's not a gadget. It's something that is more valuable, more long life. And after almost 40 years, Rubik's Cube has seen a comeback, with hundreds of competitions every year across the world. For Erno, the cube that bears his name is more than just a toy. It's a reminder to never give up. There is always a way for a solution. There is always a way to find something else, something new, something different, or find the result of your work. If today is not everything is good, it doesn't mean tomorrow can not be better. Depend on you. The legend around this chalk is that it's impossible to write a false theorem I assume the special ingredient was angel tears. Mathematicians from all the top schools very frequently use it. It's a cult favorite. As soon as I used it, I was a convert. The chalk is one of the best kept secrets in the math world. It's the Rolls Royce of chalk. Hagoromo is a brand of Japanese chalk. The way it flows on a board is a bit hard to describe in words. It's really hard to get. You can only get it from Japan. You need a Japanese person to bring it back for you. I discovered it when I went to visit the University of Tokyo, and one of the professors there said to me, you know, we have better chalk than you do in the States. And I said, oh, go on, chalk is chalk. And so I tried it out, and I was surprised to find that he was right. I tried it, and I thought it was phenomenal. It's the densest, it erases the cleanest, it leaves the nicest line. If you use bad chalk, often you have to press really hard for anyone to see what you're writing. So using Hagorama on a good board, it doesn't really feel like you're working hard to write. When I'm teaching, I get a feeling of energy, confidence, and the chalk absolutely helps. Slowly the math world has become aware of this, and it became a bit of a, a fad in some circles. It was like maybe four years ago, the word came out that the company was going out of business. I sort of jokingly referred to it as a chalk apocalypse, so I immediately started hoarding up as much as I could. I ordered three boxes of Hagoramo and kept in my office and used it very sparingly. I should have bought more, but I have friends that bought boxes and boxes and boxes of the stuff. They might very well be set for the rest of their career. We got like 1,500 sticks. That's a lot of days, four sticks a day. I think I'm gonna make it.
I have probably a 10 year supply still at home. I calculated how many boxes would I need to last for 10 or 15 years. I didn't want to become a chalk dealer, but I did like the idea that I could be the first stick is free chalk dealer on the block in my department. I was probably selling it regularly to maybe eight to 10 colleagues. I would reach into my cupboard in my office and pull out another box and we'd do the deal in my office. And we all had a chalk fix and we still do. The original Hagoroma chalk is slowly disappearing. A few years ago, uh, a Korean company bought their formulas and did the best job of faithfully reproducing it in Korea. It was mixed emotions. I was happy to know that it would still be made, but I was a little disappointed that I was less clever than I thought I was. In many ways, mathematics is like craftsmanship. In some ways it's like artistry, in some ways it's like science but there's a real high craft side to giving a beautiful lecture on a blackboard. Mathematicians admire this in each other and like to use the best tools for it. There's incredible value to this, but the value is in using it up, not hoarding it. between taste and sight. You see something that looks delicious, your mouth begins to water. You see something sour, you pucker. But what about sound? As it turns out, sound has a direct effect on how your food tastes. Oh, I'm hungry. This concept is being studied by Professor Charles Spence. I'm an experimental psychologist and uh, a gastrophysicist. The research is in two parts. Part one. We've found that on the one hand, people match music and, and instruments and pictures of sound to different tastes and flavors in food and drink. So listening to a musical scale, you might say, hmm, this Twizzler tastes like an A note, and these pretzels taste like a G note. And part two. If we then play matching music that kind of corresponds to what you're tasting. You can use that to bring out and actually change people's experience of sweetness, of flavor uh, in the food and drinks that they are consuming. Just like you can pair wine with cheese, Spence says that you can pair music with wine. Tchaikovsky's string quartet, low pitch sounds, kind of rumbling, might match better to sort of a heavy red wine to bring out bitterness. Whereas Mozart's flute concerto is a much better match for uh, certain white wines uh, and showing that we can bring out the sweetness. He actually calls it sonic seasoning. And while music has now been proven to accentuate flavor, Yum. it can also dull it. Aww. Loud background noises actually dull our salty and sweet taste receptors. Think about that next time you're served peanuts and pretzels on an airplane. Salt and sort of sweet tastes do tend to be suppressed by that background noise. The one flavor sense, however, that's not impacted? Umami. This is savory. Think tomatoes, beef, carrots, soy. When you sit on the airplane, it's amazing how many people order tomato juice and Bloody Marys. The umami taste is one that is not suppressed by loud noise, like the sound of the engines rumbling. It's an interesting concept. And in the very least, the next time you go out to eat, I guarantee you'll pay just a little more attention to the music that's playing in the background. Chemistry explains literally everything that is happening around you. The dry ice is taking the thermal energy from the water. Unfortunately, I instantaneously get judged on my appearance. That is very frustrating for me. So I'm gonna pick up my hot water, I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to throw it right into my bucket, okay? It means I have to work harder, but at the end, it is so, so incredibly worth it. And one. My name is Dr. Kate Bieberdorf and I am a lecturer at the University of Texas at Austin. 
I'm trying to break the stigma of what a stereotypical scientist looks like. So my thing is I am not wearing a bow tie, I'm not wearing suspenders, I don't have some frumpy cardigan on. I'm just some regular girl who likes to play with fire, and I also really like designer shoes, and that's okay. As the alginate hits the calcium chloride, the alginate would prefer to be with the two plus charge calcium instead of the one plus charge sodium, and what happens is we form gummy worms. Doesn't matter what you look like, any human can be a scientist. I definitely try to use energy and excitement. I love this one. <laughs> I do my best to try to reach students that might be intimidated by science. I use anything that will make the 483 students sit up straight and actually listen to the words coming out of your mouth. As soon as I've exploded something in their face, I have their attention for just 60 seconds and I can do whatever I can to shove that knowledge right into their brains. Ah, yay! <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do today is doing some chemistry. We're gonna do three different hands-on experiments. I find chemistry to be an incredibly challenging topic. Pour your water, pour your water. Beautiful, now keep watching, keep watching. I'm so sick of the stereotypical female scientists, and we can do things other than biology, by the way. Chemistry, physics, engineering, we can do it. Look at what you made! The fact that I've been able to master it, but then use science to start the conversation, but then physically stand there and break that image, it's the most rewarding thing I could ever do, ever.